I hope you can see the screen now. Yes. Good. It's, it's a pity I can't be in, in person. That would be a lot more fun. Uh, and I think it was better, but uh, Ericsson is quite strict. They still have a travel ban in place for all business travel. So kind of stuck in my country for a business week, at least. Uh, so today we'll go through the, the 5D MR. Uh, mainly the fiscal layer, a little bit of, of uh, layer two as well. Uh, it will be a quite intense um, day, I would say, uh, but I hope you get something out of it. And, and please do interrupt me if I have questions or comments or th whatever it could be. Maybe we can deviate from the slides. We can talk about, about some other MR aspect if you want to. So it's, um, I mean, I'm, I'm doing this for, for your sake. You're not listening for, for, for my purpose. It's, I'm trying to, to give you something. So do do stop me, do ask questions, do interrupt me whenever you, you feel like it. So the plan is a little bit like this. Uh, timing is a little bit rough. So roughly one hour each will be the 50 minute break in between uh, and the lunch in the middle of the day. And all, all these times are our finish time. So they should be relevant for, for most of you. I, I don't know if everyone is in person or if, if someone is sitting remotely. Nevertheless, it, it's finish time on this schedule. So. Five parts, starting a little bit with a general overview, time frequency, structure, and so on. Uh, and the second part will be more on, on coding and multi antenna, then a lunch, and then three sessions in the afternoon. There are a little bit, uh, not as many slides on those sessions, so there are a little bit um, more space in those, I would say. And I also have some spare time at the end, so that's the plan. And I guess you, you got all the slides in advance as well. Uh, at least I emailed them to do all of, so you should have access to them. And there you find more slides than what I will show today. I, I basically sent you all the slides, uh, and, but I will show a subset of them because timing-wise, we, we can't get through all of them. And I guess people fall asleep if you try to do that. So, so I, I will use a subset of, of the slides. OK, that said, let's start with the First part, a little bit general about NR uh, architecture-wise, time frequency structure and so, so you get some, some high-level feeling for what it is. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with 3D PP, the, the stand, standard setting organization or standard developing organization uh, doing uh, NR. And, but uh, we have releases. Uh, there's a new release roughly every 18th month or so, it varies a little bit. Uh, and, and it started all the way back to, to 3D. So the, the release where MR first appeared was release 15. And that was uh, completed in um, mid-2018. Uh, so that was the first uh, 5D specification. And actually, it was uh, an early drop by the end of 2017 with, with uh, non, the non-standalone version of it. We'll get back to what that is later on. Uh, to meet uh, early commercial requirements, because some operators wanted to be early out and deploy it already in 2018. So we needed a, an early drop in the end of 2017 as well. So that was a bit unusual. And the focus on this first release, that was a lot of MBB, uh, because that is the, the service we know that flies business-wise. Uh, there was also some focus on ultra-reliable low latency communication in, in that first release. And then it comes new releases, release 16, that's completed uh, basically beginning of last year. And there we have uh, integrated access and backhaul, which is basic relaying. We have support for unlicensed spectra. We had some uh, more support for, for uh, enhanced URLC or industrial internet of things, but positioning and then uh, other things as well. And then right now, three people is working on release 17, which is about to conclude uh, end of this year. So it's, uh, the last thing putting in place right now. So that, that release has been a little bit longer because due to the COVID situation, the, all the fiscal meetings have been, uh, yeah, were not post possible to have. So we, we had email and uh, electronic meetings during the last one and a half year, and that slows down progress a bit. But in, in that release 17, we looked at the higher frequencies, uh, up to 71 gigahertz. We have looked at how to integrate satellites. Red cap is it basically is reduced capability. It is um, intention is to support industrial uh, things, industrial IoT and things like that. But with a 
little bit reduced capabilities. You don't need the, the, the gigabits you can get from MR, you, you can do with something less. Multicast broadcast is another thing we have there as well, and a couple of other things. And then we'll start release 18 and release 19, and then at some point release 20, and then we'll probably get into the 60 era. So, sorry, sorry, yeah. uh, I just missed what NTN is. Non terrestrial networks. It's basically satellites. Okay. Flying platforms. Because so that has been a quite a hot area lately with. A uh, lot of the satellite industry joining 3DPP as well, and then see, can we use this this technology also for satellite purposes? So the two worlds are, are getting closer. And that is about to be finished now, obviously. Yes, release 17 is about to be finished. And when it comes to MTN, the satellites, there's also some satellites for, for work for LTE as well, yeah. actually. But release 17 is about to finish, so the, um, new, the specification will be updated by the end of this year, and then we we'll start to work on release 18 instead. So what, what do we get from, from uh, MR? Uh, this is my, my kind of standard slide, if I want to highlight a few things. Uh, first thing you should talk about is ultra-lean. I have some, some slides on, on, on that later on. We have a wider spectrum range. Uh, if you look at 4D, it was designed to fall from below gigahertz up to 4 or 5 gigahertz or so. But with MR, we do all the way up to 52.6 gigahertz and in release 17 also up to 71 gigahertz. It's much, much wider frequency range with a millimeter wave included. We have multi antenna support. Uh, that is needed when you move up to these very high frequencies. The link budget is very tough. So you, you basically need to do beam forming and things like that to do. To, to bridge that gap and get communication through. So we, we multi antenna support is integrated in MR release 15 from the beginning. Of course, we had multi antenna also in 4G with, with MIME and all that stuff. Uh, but in 5G, we took it one step further. So also for initial access and cell search and these type of idle mode procedures also support multi antenna uh, transmissions and then beam forming, unlike 4G. And low latency but also something that, that was a lot in, in focus for, for MR. How can we reduce the latency so that you, you get a very low ping time, so to say, to, to the server and back again? And in the middle, we, we put uh, forward compatibility. That's basically trying to design a system that is forward compatible, which of course is very diff difficult and, and you probably fail in some aspect, but at least we would try to make it very easy to introduce new technologies. If you want to put in some new new channel in the future, some new waveforms, a new feature or something, that should be easy to do. So these are some of the highlights of, of MR radio access. So if we start with ultralean, this is basically ultralean. The idea is if you don't have anything to say, you should not transmit. If the base station do not have any data to transmit, the base edge should be silent. And that, that sounds like a quite uh, obvious thing. Uh, and in some sense it is, but in, in, in previous generations, there were, were a lot of reference signals being sent out constantly all the time, which made sense for, for the type of uh, scenarios they were designed for. But uh, here we wanted to make it ultra lean. So do not transmit unless you have data to convey. So the amount of always on transmissions in, in form of sync signals and so on is very, very small. That has several benefits. One is, of course, that they save power at the base station. You can shut down the, the power amplifier and a lot of other circuitry when you don't transmit. You re reduce the electricity bill, which actually is quite a big part of the, the operator expenses. It reduces interference, because if you don't transmit, you won't disturb anyone else. And it also enables this forward compatibility quite easy, because if, if your time frequency resource, resource looks like this screen, it's very easy to find some spot to put in some new channel or some new signal or something in the future. So this is one, one big thing. And if you want to do something ultra lean, you have to rethink uh, procedures on random access, cell search, and a lot of other things that, that in the past assumed that you had signals present all the time. And then the, that bridges quite nicely to forward compatibility. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, 
I mean, the first thing, minimize all resonant transmission. We just talked about that ultra lean aspect. Uh, another thing we, we tried to do was to, to keep transmissions together in frequency. Do not spread out channels across the full bandwidth unless necessary, or at least not in a static manner. If you do it dynamically as part of the, the scheduling of data, that's fine, but uh, no, no fixed resources spanning the full bandwidth because then you kind of block your frequencies in the, for future use. The same thing in, in the time domain. If, if you have various fixed timing relations, <clears throat> that you transmit something in the downlink and, and you expect something in the uplink a fixed point in time later or vice versa, then you kind of block those resources in the other direction as well, and that, that you don't want to do. So that's something we avoided as well. Frequency-wise, uh, I said that we moved up in frequency with, with NR, and that's true. And the reason we do that is not because it, it's better or that is more fun or so. It is more challenging, but the reason we do it is to get access to more bandwidth. We need more spectrum. And if you look in the, in the lower parts here, one, two, three gigahertz, it, it's quite busy with, with a lot of um, other systems running there, other cellular system and communication system and a lot of other things. So you cannot find a very wide bandwidth there. You can find 20 or 40 megahertz or something like that. But if you move up to the, to the millimeter range here, around 30 gigahertz, we can find uh, up to 800 megahertz of bandwidth in, in that range. So much wider channels gives you much higher date rates, which is something we want to get. But that also means that we need to move up in, in these higher frequency bands and then take all the challenges in terms of um, beam forming and then tricky propagation conditions and, and so on. So it's tougher up there, but it, it gives you wide bandwidth in return. <clears throat> so and <clears throat> sorry, NR is designed to support all this full range, uh, and we do that with, in a couple of slides. Come to the fact that the NR is OFDM based, and we. To, to handle those different frequencies, we, we settle for different subcarriage spacings. In principle, if you design an OFDM system, you want to do have as low subcarriage spacing as possible because then you can get a relatively long cycle prefix in, in microseconds without increasing the overhead too much. Problem with the low subcarriage spacing is that one problem is that you can't do very high Dopplers. So you, you probably shouldn't have a Doppler frequency higher than roughly 10% of the subcarriage spacing. Another problem is that um, you put strict requirements on your local oscillators and so on, phase noise and things like that. So with that in mind, we, we settle for, for lower subcarriage spacing in the low frequency bands, but when we move up to higher frequency bands, we, we need to increase the subcarriage spacing because oscillators get not as good uh, at 30 gigahertz compared to one gigahertz. So that's that's why we have that. We have the possibility to, to choose different subcarriage spacings. And as you see here, between uh, 6 and 24 gigahertz, there's, there's a gap between a frequency range 1 and frequency range 2. And NR supports that, but there's, there's no frequency band identified yet for, for cellular usage there. So. But if you get them in the future, it's easy to just specify some, some RF requirements and start to use them. Sorry. Yes. So there is this uh, mainly paired spectrum, mainly unpaired spectrum. Yeah. So uh, all higher, the frequency range 2 is mainly unpaired spectrum, meaning DDD. Yes, correct. And uh, you, you can probably <laughs> strike the word mainly, it is unpaired. And you, you can find TDD and unpaired spectrum was in the lower bands around two, two, three gigahertz, but it, it's not as common. So typically FTD in the lower bands and typically TDD in, in the upper bands. But NR as such is designed to completely flexible, so you can run FTD or TDD in any frequency band, given what, what you have access to. Because the paired or unpaired spectrum, that basically comes from the frequency regulators. There's nothing that you can choose. You, you get what you get. But that, that's a good point. When we move up in frequency, we, we typically go more and more in the TDD direction, which is a little bit interesting standardization wise as well, because if you look back on, on 3D and 4D, they were designed with FTD in mind and then a little bit, oh yes, we have TDD as well, let's, let's support that as well. 
and it came a little bit as an addition. Uh, here and now, the discussion was very much focused around TDD and, and with the mindset, yes, we need to support FTD as well, by the way. So it was a little bit the other way around, which was kind of in interesting in a sense. So, sorry, uh, let's say that we could take this opportunity to make a small uh, audience uh, audience uh, uh, knowledge level interview or interrogation. So, who does who knows what TDD means? Everybody. So the background is in place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. You transmit and receive on the same frequency. You have to take turn in, in time. Now we, we get back to that in, in some coming slides a little bit, actually. Beamforming, uh, I, I think I said this before, that we, we designed it with beamforming in mind, including also initial access, not just the, the connected mode um, transmissions. And um, it, it is a little bit tough to find the right beam direction. I, I don't know whether you have played this uh, game. I don't know what to call it in English. In the Swedish, we call it strut, football. You basically put this cone on your head, so you just see a small hole in, in front of you, and you try to play football or soccer. Um, sometimes people are drunk when they do it as well, which, of course, makes it even more tricky. But it, it, it basically illustrates what you need to do when, when you try to, to do beam form. It's very, very difficult to find the, the ball with this cone on your head compared to if you don't have it. And the same thing with radio. If you have a very narrow beam and you need to point it in the right direction, how do you figure out in what direction to, to point that beam? So that is, is challenging. So I put all those mechanisms in, in, in place before and now, and we, we touch on some of them later on when we, we get to the subsequent sessions here. Yeah, and this was just an example to give you a little bit of feeling for, it's a short movie clip I will send. You see the basic, the, um, the radio propagation from a, this red dot, which is the, the transmitter to the green dot, which is the, the mobile driving around. And this is a fairly open space with a, with a parking lot in, in Shista, close to the Ericsson headquarters. And here you can see how the, the reflection changes over time, where the radio wave bounces. And try to, and this is driving in, in a normal, relatively slow speed. Try to follow this with beamforming and figure out which direction to point your beam all the time. And you, you get the thing that it is not that difficult. No, not that easy. Even though in this case, you, you to a large extent have one line of sight path, which of course makes sense to use, but you have a lot of, of reflections as well. So it, it is quite quite a challenge compared to the, the more kind of broader beams, more omni-like systems we have, at, we have at lower frequencies. I said that low latency was one big thing of NR as well. Uh, and you can't really find one technology that, that gives you all the low latency benefits. There's a lot of different things all together that, that gives you this. So we had a frame structure that's laser friendly. For example, we put the, the demodulation reference signals for channel estimation at the beginning and the control signaling as well. So once you receive this first part of the slot, then you can immediately start to process your data. Mm -hmm. And there's no time domain interleaving, so you can more or less do processing of the received signal on the fly. And at, at the end of the slot here, you more or less have decoded all your data and you can very quickly send back an acknowledgement to the base station telling the base station whether you received the data correctly or not. Unlike some, some previous system where you do a lot of time domain interleaving, you spread out your reference signals over the, the, the time domain, which means that you need to receive the full slot, buffer it and kind of start your decoding until you receive the full slot. So. That's one of the details that that, uh, that made this possible in MR. Now the thing is that uh, since it's <laughs> 10 years later in LTE, of course, the, the silicon technology has progressed, so you can do faster processing, more powerful chips and so on. So you, you can run your decoder faster. Uh, high LA protocols, they also did their part of it. So they, they did a different uh, header structures that basically you can pre-process a lot of the protocol layers and just in the last minute when you know, or last fraction of a second, when you know exactly what data rate you're allowed to transmit that, then you can pick the right number of pre-assembled data blocks from high protocol layers. Unlike LT, where you couldn't assemble everything until you know how it was scheduled and how big the payload was. So there's a lot of things like this that, that all together contributes to the the low latency. And the, the target was to, to, to have standardized support of one millisecond round trip time from the edge of the 
the, the radio network and back. And that, that you can do, even though in practice you probably are a little bit slower, but you, you get very close to it actually. Okay, that was some of the, the high level stuff. Uh, we also have, and I, I think there's one, one slide in your it's like it there on, on the, some of the benefits. Maybe it comes there, I don't remember if I did hide it or not. But we also have the, this slicing that was one big thing in, in 5G. And, and that was the intention of uh, running multiple, virt in some sense, the same thing as you do in a computer. You set up a number of virtual computers on one physical computer. You can run a number of virtual networks on one physical network. Uh, optimizing each, each of these slices for, for whatever purpose they serve. So you can have one MBB slice, and then maybe you want to have some robot control thing with very low latency. So you can send up, set up a robot slice with very low latency, and maybe a third slice for, for something else. That gives you a lot of flexibility. If there's so, a robot. Yes? To, to what extent does that slicing, is the slicing reflected on the, let's say, the radio access network level? Oh, oh. It's mainly visible on the, on the core network, actually. Really? Mainly on the core network. We, we, maybe we should go through the architecture here first. Uh, okay. what the core is. It's, it, it's not that visible on the radio access level because you basically have all the flexibility there from the beginning. <clears throat> if, if you look at the, the architectural options, uh, if you remember one of the first slides that talked about non standalone, uh, that was December 2017, this is a little bit early drop. And that was the intention of using the or the, the way you use LTE, the 4D system connected to the 4D core network. Typically in, in cellular system, you have a radio access network and a core network. And the radio access network takes care of all the, the, the radio aspects, uh, scheduling and coding and modulation and, and these type of things. Whereas the core network takes care mm -hmm. of some highlight things like billing and, and, and authentication and things like that. So with a non-standalone approach, the, the um, 4G core and, and 4G RAND were handling initial access and mobility and so on. And then you had the NR system just as a date rate booster. Once you were connected to the system, you can run data or LT and NR at the same time and to get high date rates. But uh, half a year later, the, the spec on the standalone NR what was done, where you have a 5G core, 5G RAN and all the initial access and everything can be done on 5G only, so you don't need, need 4G. So these are the, the two main options we have in, uh, in NR. There's actually a whole range of, of different uh, architectural options, how you can combine the 4G RAN and the, the 5G RAN with the 4G core and the 5G core and, and basically all combinations you can think of. I don't think the other combinations are that interesting. They, they just <laughs> had a lot of complexity. So these are the two ones that are in, in practice are of relevance, I would say. But the, all combinations you can think of were, were discussed in, in, in standards and are more or less supported in, in the spec. Yeah, here, here we get to, to the slicing. Uh, and that is something you can do with, with the 5G core. And, and as I said, the idea is to be able to set up different slices here. You can have an MBB web surfing slice, media slice, some robotics, some health or whatever. And the idea here is to quickly be able to try out some new service. You come up with, with a new service you want to try out. You don't know whether it flies business-wise or not, but you can configure it in the network. You can run it and see if, if you get subscribers and usage of it. If not, you can, you can just deconfigure it. And that's, of course, much less expensive compared to building a complete separate physical network. And that, that is mainly done at the core network level. So the, the RAN, the radio access network, doesn't really have to bother too much with this. It's basically just setting quality of service parameters for different data flows and make sure that the scheduling is done in the right way. But uh, you, you don't see it that much on, on the RAN side. There were also a more cloud-friendly architecture on, on the core network side in, in 5G. So instead of the, the old way of thinking where we basically have different uh, boxes and you define the interfaces between the, these boxes, you define different services. These are basically the small containers in, in, in a cloud or something like that that can send messages to each other and, and, and do whatever it's supposed to do. And then 
interface down to the radio access network. The, the, the core network in, in 5G is a lot more cloud friendly than in, in, in previous Gs. Uh, and something that's likely to happen in 60s that also the RAM will become more and more cloudified or cloud inspired in a way, but not, not yet in, in, in 5G, at least not from a spec perspective. And there's, there's some uh, additions on the quality of service handling that you can do in, in, the, in the 5G core that you cannot do with the 4G core. Um, and then, of course, you need that to support slicing as well. So there are benefits of, of using the 5G core connected to the 5G RAM. But both of the standalone and non-standalone are in use commercially, so they're, they're both of okay. relevance in practice. So if we now get back to the expression of mine, so you have now this network slicing here, and you said that this is done mainly in the core network, and that really have so much to do with the RadioX network. But then we recall that 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 or we we looking forward, we know that there are many kind of parameterizations that that you can do which are affecting things on, on the service quality and the round trip time and so on. That, that depends very much on, on how you parameterize your radio access network. Yes. And then how, what the core network can promise, and that depends very much on what the radio access network can do. So if you go to robotic communication and some more challenging, you let's say, slices, so, that's it, kind of, if, if you talk about this ultra-reliable communication, what not, so those uh, low latencies, high reliability, so those things, they should be something that you create in the radio access, right? Yeah, uh, so of, of course you need your, your, your radio access to, to be able to support all the low latency, whatever, what you need. Uh, and it, of course, there's a limit on how much it can support in terms of load, etc. So you need to have a big enough radio access network to support whatever you want to do on, with your slices. But in case of, of your latest critical robot uh, arm here and MBB both need to do something at the same time, then with the slices you can make sure that give give the robot whatever it needs to, to do its task and then whatever is left uh, on a more best effort basis to, to the MBB slice. That type of prioritization you can do here. But okay. of course, if you throw in yet another robot slice, and then at some point you will hit the limit of what the RAN can support, and then you probably need to, to build out your, your RAN as well with more capacity and more processing as well. So it, it kind of works in a way that the radio access network is dimensioned to, to uh, capable of doing whatever it does, and then the uh, core network is, is using the services as best it sees. Yeah. You can you can view it like that. Okay. Okay, and here these type of uh, architecture pictures usually get quite boring with just boxes and lines, but it is good to have a little bit of, of feeling for for the interfaces. So you have the core network, uh, and you have the access mobility function and the user plane function. So here's basically the user data flows through this one, and this one is the um, interface between the core and the RAM, and then you have all the other services up here. And then you have something we call the G node B, I abbreviated G and B here. Uh, and that is, it's a logical node, but in practice you can say it's a base station. And of course the, this base station is connected to core network with, with the user plane interface NGU and a, and a control plane interface NGC. And then the uh, different gene or beasts that are, are connected to each other also with the XN interface. So have a user plane and, and the control plane part of it. And the, this XN interface is used, for example, for, for mobility. If you want to do a handover from one base station to another, then you can send the, the necessary messages on this XN interface. And then we have something that we knew in 5G that we didn't have in 4G. We can actually split uh, gene or B in a central unit and a distributed unit. You can view it as the, the kind of upper parts of the base station and the, the lower part of the base station. So in the lower part, you have modulation and coding and, and things like that. In the upper part, you have some of the upper layer protocols. And you have an interface called F1 between those two. And the, the idea with that was, of course, to, to put, uh, to centralize some of the processing in big box and then have a number of little bit simpler boxes spread out and, uh, I think this F1 interface became unnecessarily complex, so it didn't 
turn out to be the, the best way of doing it, perhaps. Uh, but it, it, it's also used in this uh, integrated access and backhaul in release 16, where you basically can cascade a number of DUs and then feed them, connect them wirelessly to, to, to your network to, to build up a relay type of network. And then we have what in the three people call UE, user equipment. That, that is your, your hands at the uh, smartphone or whatever it is. And that's connected to the, the base station with the UU interface. So I don't expect that we will remember all these different abbreviations, but at least you've seen them and you know a little bit. And uh, you probably see the, the name Gino B and UE throughout some of the slides. So that could be good to, to remember that the Gino B is basically a base station, roughly speaking, and the UE is the, in the terminal. And why is called the uh, node B? That, that has the longest history, all, all the way back in, in uh, 3D days, 20 years ago. They, they sketched architecture and they couldn't agree what to call the base station. So they said, ah, let's temporarily call this for node B. And, and they never <laughs> came out of that. The base station in 3D was node B. And then in, in 4D, it was an en enhanced node B, E node B. And in 5D, it's a generalized node B, a G node B. <laughs> Let's see what we can call it in 16. But there will probably be something with no B in it. <laughs> yeah. Protocol stack, uh, pretty standard one, I would say. We, we do uh, some call to service flow handling. We prioritize. We have a PDCP packet data convergence protocol. That is doing uh, ciphering, heavy compression, and things like that. Then we do uh, RLC, radio link control. We can do uh, segmentation. If the package is, is bigger than what you can fit on the, on, on the radio interface at this point in time, you, you can chop it up. You have a retransmission protocol here as well. Then you multiplex everything together to so get one flow. And, and uh, then you do a hybrid AIQ, which is another retransmission protocol. We will talk more about these retransmission protocols after lunch. We'll get back to those. And then after the medium access control, we get down to the fiscal A with, with coding and uh, antenna mapping and modulation and these type of things. This is, in some sense, a fairly traditional protocol stack, uh, quite similar to 4G and probably also 3D. And here you see the split between the CU and DU. That's done here between the PDCP and the RLC. Now, just one question. For slicing, we, what I understand from you, until now we didn't reach to the point in 5G to, uh, to slice the radio bar. No, no, not in a static way. I mean, you 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 can dynamically, of course, if if you have data both for the robot and then for for the the broadband thing coming at the same time, then you can prioritize control. The, the core network can make sure that the, the robot data gets priority here, and then the robot data gets through all this in a sense, and the, the MBB data has to wait until the robot is data is through. So it, it's not a, a static slicing in the sense that you set aside certain time resources or frequency resources for a certain service, because that would be inefficient. So you want to do that on a, on a very dynamic basis as part of the, the scheduling. So at each point in time, you take a decision what, what data to prioritize and what, what to Transmit or not transmit. Thank you. I think you're asking if the slicing is on the RAM part or not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question: uh, Wouldn't it be actually possible to um, distribute this entire DU essentially on individual small base stations? So essentially having like a multi base station communication with one user in like small the next cells. Of it. Yeah, small cells essentially. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, uh, one thing that NR is designed a little bit in, in with more attention to small cells compared to, to 4D, I would say. And yes, you, you can build a DU that is quite small, like a small, small box that you put in a wall or on, on the wall or in the ceiling or something. And of course, you can put the next one 10 meters further apart if you want to. And that's what, what you do in, in indoor deployment sometimes. And maybe you put one small DU in each room or something like that. A little bit like you would deploy some, some Wi-Fi nodes, same type of thing. And then you can have this DU processing done in, in, in that small node and you put all the CU stuff at one place. You could, of course, if you want to, put everything in one small node altogether. It's completely up to the implementation, what you as a manufacturer think makes sense and 
and that you can sell and so on. So the standard doesn't tell you anything on how to implement it. It just, just gives you the tools to, to implement things in a lot of different ways. Head restructure, I think we, we mentioned this before, that we, we did the head restructure in such a way that, that it uh, minimizes latency. Uh, I won't dig into details here, but if you compare with 4 you see some differences. And then we have two things, uh, dual connectivity and carrier aggregation. And dual connectivity, that's basically that after the PDCP protocol, after the, the DU but before the CU, you can split up your, your data flow on, on two data flows like this. And each of these, the, the, the pink one and, and the yellow one, is scheduled completely independently, does their own retransmissions and so on. And oh. one usage of this, or the primary usage, I would say, is the non standalone setup with the LTE. Then you have, would have an LTE leg with all the control signal and mobility, and then you add on the, the NR just as a date rate booster. That's probably the primary usage of dual connectivity, but you, you, you can also use it if you have a, if you have um, two cells and want to increase your, your data rates uh, by splitting the flow into two flows and, and transmit both of them. Uh, excuse me, can you also duplicate, like send the same data through the two, two different uh, RLCs? Yes. You, you can, you, you can duplicate the data through the same exact, exact the same data through both of these legs. And that, that could be good for, for reliability reasons, for example. So in the receiver, hopefully you receive at least one copy. And if you transmit those from, from, from different cell sites, for example, so if one path is blocked, hopefully the other path is not blocked and is received properly by, by the UE. So that's another usage of it. And then in, in receiving end, if it, if it sees that two packets, two copies of the same packets, are alive, then of course it throws away one of them because you just need one copy. But you can also do carrier aggregation, and that is within the same genome. You see here the, the split is a much lower layer. That's much further down, basically just before the physical layer. And uh, the main reason for this is to, to increase your bandwidth. So let's say you have a 100 megahertz carrier, and then you get hold of another 100 megahertz carrier. Why not glue them together so that you get performance like 200 gigahertz, or megahertz, things like that? Or you have a fragment of spectrum. You have 20 mega at one band and another 20 mega at another band. Uh, why not, so to say, glue them together so you get 40 megahertz of, of spectrum and you can offer higher date rates and so on? In this case, it's done within the same base station uh, and as part of the scheduling which is this, it's, it's one schedule in the base station. That schedule determines for each, basically on the millisecond basis, uh, which data to put where and how to transmit it. Unlike dual connectivity, where each base station had their own schedule and there's less of, they're not as um, tightly integrated in the two legs here. And you can, of course, combine the two. So you can do dual connectivity and within each of these two legs, you can have a carrier aggregation. So that, that's also possible. But the, the, the big difference is this is between genome Bs and this is within the same genome B. So that's the, the high level difference between the two. How would you differentiate this thing with the architecture that you've shown before uh, with genome B control unit and genome B data unit? How are we differentiated from what? So this. Um, this dual connectivity, is it between like uh, G node B? Could it be between uh, G node B data units? Like, yeah, if, if you implement it that way, I would say this is the CU, the PDCP part here, and then you have one DU down here, and then you have another DU down here. So, so that, that, that's where you would view it in, in the architecture domain. There's one CU, but then two different DUs, and those DUs could very well and typically are at different uh, sites. But it would not be between G and B then, so you don't use this X interface there? No, okay, maybe, maybe one should write between DUs here instead of G and Bs. Uh, of course, this could be a complete G and B with, with a PDCP for some other user up here, but uh, that's not shown here. 
But uh, maybe it would be more correct to say between the DUs or something like that. And here we say within the same DU. That, that's probably a stricter way of writing it too. Good point. Sorry, the U and C U stands for uh, the uh, distributed unit and the core unit. Core unit. The C is a central unit. Mm -hmm. And distributed unit. So. Distributed unit. Yeah. Another thing, uh, is it possible to actually have orthogonal like frequencies, like an OFDM on the dual connectivity? So like you have frequencies divided in that way? How would you this? Uh, I missed how you define the frequency. Uh, so, I mean, if you want to define, because you can define radio as a real link control of both of them, right? Yes. So you choose subcarriers and you basically, so the control layer basically divides the subcarriers, orthogonal subcarriers on the two. So you essentially have two orthogonal in like one system. On one, you know, it'd be obviously, this is only on one. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that the tip. The way to do dual connectivity is to, to sort of say interlace the subcarriers. It's probably more on a carrier basis. But in principle, you could, uh, I think you could do it and then interlace the two on, on a resource block level with, with 12 subcarriers each. But I never heard anyone trying to do that. But I, I guess you could, unless there's some small signal somewhere that, that messes up. But, but the typical way is to, to run these on different carrier frequencies. Okay. Okay, and then a little bit on RRP state, radio resource control. Uh, and I would say any wireless system have a, typically have at least two states. Um, in LTE in 4D, we had the, the idle state and the connected state. Whereas the idle state is where, where it typically sits. Uh, when you're not using your phone, you, there's no data transfer. You have no context. You don't have an IP address. Uh, no core network connection. The device just figure out which which cell to camp upon when when you move around. And then when you want to transmit data, you go to the connected state. So you you have an IP address. The core network is aware about this uh, device. The network is in, in charge of mobility, so the network knows when to hand over the the, the handset or the UV from one cell to another. Those were the two states you had in 4G. Uh, and then it turned out that handset manufacturers, they, they of course, they had to do be an RC connected to do data transfer. But then they were very keen on quick to go to RC idle to, to absolute to minimize the, the power consumption and save battery. Which meant that when when you later on a second later clicked on the link or, or you got to some, some notification or something, you have to reestablish the connection, go back to connected. And that, that takes some control signaling. So to handle that in LT, there in NR and also in later releases of LT, there's actually an intermediate state as well, an RRC inactive state, where you can't transfer any data, but you keep your your, your context, all the configuration, and then the IP address and so on. There's a little bit of a mix of the two. So it gives you the the low power consumption of the idle state. But it keeps the configuration so you quickly can switch back to connect the state to, tr to transmit data. So it, it's, it sits in between those two states. So that is something that NR has. And the, the idea is then that you, you, you transmit your data, then you go to RC inactive, and then quickly back to connected and jump between these two, at least for these type of very frequent switching, but when you have a second or two between your packets. And then uh, I thought I need to have a, a slide on, on scheduling. Uh, we'll talk more about that later on, but uh, I've already talked about this. It's probably good to know this fact that the basic structure is that the, the gene or B is in charge of controlling all the data transmissions in the cell. So it determines when the UV is allowed to transmit in the uplink and when the UV is supposed to, to receive data in the downlink. So it basically takes the, these decisions on, on a millisecond basis or even faster than a millisecond. So in the downlink, the, the schedule figures, figures out from which of the data flows to take data. And of course, if you do some slicing, may, maybe it gets information that yes, prioritize this uh, robotic thing rather than the, the MBB. And then multiplexes its modulation coding and, and sends it to the, the, the UE. 
And in order to do good transmission, it, it gets channel state information from the US. It gets knowledge about the radio quality experienced by the US. It can pick the, the set of sub carriers that has a high quality and avoid those that are bad quality. Same thing in the uplink. You have the scheduler sitting in, in the base station or in the DU. Uh, but in this case, of course, you have all the data buffers in the U. So then you need to send some buffer status reports and things like that. And then you take a decision in, in the in the DU and have the UE. Now we're supposed to transmit with this data rate using this modulation scheme on, on those resources. So the, the base station is in control. And the baseline is dynamic scheduling, that you dynamically take a decision uh, all the time. You can also do a, more of a semi-persistent scheduling or scheduling without a dynamic grant, where you in advance configure some resources, telling you that every 10th millisecond I, I will transmit to you on these resources, or, or you you can transmit every every 20 or 50 or whatever millisecond in uplink on, on, on that resource. But the baseline is uh, dynamic scheduling. So the, the scheduler in the base station is in control of, of all the transmission activities. Okay, that was the kind of high level architecture introduction. Um, I thought we, we can take a look at the time frequency structure, uh, a little bit what that looks like as well before we, we take a break. Uh, if that's okay with you. So, I have a couple of slides of this. It's maybe like a half an hour or so, 20 minutes. No particular questions in architecture slides so far. We can, of course, get back to them if, if something comes to mind. So, you not hesitate yeah. to ask questions. Okay. Yes, let's jump in into the fiscal layer uh, all the way down in the, at the bottom, more or less. The, the waveform we use in, in NR, it's OFDM. Classical OFDM, which you typically implement with an FFT and an addition of a cycle prefix. And I, I guess you're familiar with, with OFDM and um, the properties of it. So the, the idea is to be robust to, to time dispersion, thanks to the cycle prefix, and, and be able to do a simple receiver out of that. And as, as I said, we have a, have a scalable numerology. Uh, and if, if you know LD, you will see that this 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing is the same as we have in, in LD. Uh, and then you get a cycle prefix of uh, roughly 4.7 microseconds. So you, you can have a handle time dispersion or, or delay spread up to 4.7 microseconds approximately. Of, of course, it still works beyond that, but then you get the degradation in, in, in SNR. And that was a good choice for, for relatively large cells running at one, two gigahertz cell range. So we kept that 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing. Another reason why we kept it is what we'll get in a couple of slides that you can actually do coexisting. You can put 5G on top of a 4G carrier, and then it's easier if you have the same subcarrier spacing. But then, as I said, in order to support the high carrier frequencies, where your oscillators get less accurate and noisier and so on, it's good to have a higher subcarrier spacing at, at those frequencies. So we we can actually scale it in, in fact, so two, up to 200, 120 kilohertz for data transmissions. And then you see the, the cycle prefix scales down in, in proportion. But then you can't have, handle as high time dispersion. But that's tip fine because at those frequencies, High carry frequency, you typically have a relatively small cell, you have a lot of beam forming, so you don't experience as much delay spread as you do in, in the lower large cell deployment. So you have this scalability possibility here. So that's something you, you're configuring in your system. And as I said, OFDM, that is actually the, the baseline also in the uplink. And this is a little bit unlike LT, because in LT we had a DFT spread of them, so we put a DFT in front of it here. And the reason for that in LT was to reduce the peak to average ratio, because the peak to average ratio is quite high uh, on an OFDM signal, which forces you to, to build a somewhat bigger power, power amplifier than it would otherwise do, because you need to handle those, those peaks as well. And you, if you don't want to do that in, in the device, you can do DFT 
pre-coded OTM, and that is the only possibility you have in LT. So that is good for, for device reasons, but it's not that nice when it comes to the combination with MIMO and so on, it gets more complicated. So in Emna, we said that we do OFTM in both uplink and downlink, but we have a complementary possibility for DFT spread uplink in case of single lay transmission with, with no MIMO. Then you can, the network can decide to turn on this DFT precoder, thereby allowing the GV maybe to, to, to get, gain a DB or two of, of um, coverage. There are other ways of improving the, the peak to average situation on, on with them with, with implementation specific ways of doing it. So you can, you can do that as well. But the, the specification offers you the possibility for additional complementary uh, DFT pre coding if you want to. Frame structure, if you look in the time domain. Uh, we have, that, yeah. So this, whether or not you do this additional DFT pre-coding at the UE transmitter is something that you negotiate between the UE and the base station, or is it just the UE that's what it wants? Or? No, the, the base station configures it. Uh, okay. It's mandatory in UE, so it's, a, it's up to the network whether you want to use it or not. So the base station tells the UE that you should turn on your DFT pre-coder or you should not. Okay. And it, it's a kind of semi-static thing. So you you set that up and then you leave it like that. It's nothing that you change dynamically. So, so the, you can actually get that information as part of the initial access procedure. And it depends then on, on whether you are in a large macro cell, whatever. And, and yeah, I, I would say it depends on what, what the network vendor has decided to do. Uh, but uh, you're probably right that this DFT procoding makes more sense in a large macro cell where you really want to maximize coverage and maybe you don't do MIMO at the cell border. Whereas in the smaller cells, uh, you probably have more power available in UE, but also do higher data rates and typically maybe even use MIMO in the uplink if you have a UE that's capable of that. And then it makes more sense to have both of them. So roughly speaking, there's probably a linkage to the, the cell size and, and so on. But. It's completely up to the implementation. Okay. Then in the time domain, uh, we have a frame structure with 10 millisecond radio frames. They don't really serve any purpose whatsoever on, on the fiscal layer, uh, but they're used by a higher layer as so some kind of timing indication for, for certain signaling and so on. And then each, each subframe is divided into 10 subframes. Uh, Number nine is outside the screen, as you see. And then each subframe is divided into one or more slots. So a subframe is always one millisecond long. That's the term inherited from LTE, basically. But the slot length, a slot is always 14 symbols. And then, of course, depending on what subcare spacing you use, the, the slots become shorter and shorter. So if you do 30 kilohertz, then you can fit in two slots in, into one millisecond. And if you do 60 kilohertz, you can fit in four slots into one millisecond and so on. Uh, and as you see here, I have a little bit of orange color at, at, uh, at the beginning here, uh, at one of the symbols, so that should be a, there as well. Uh, it is so that every seventh symbol has a slightly longer cycle prefix than the others, and that's uh, uh, if you really go into the details, it comes to you due to that with the 15 kilohertz uh, subcase spacing and the, the sampling clock you get out of that in order to fit an integer number of samples within one millisecond, you have to, to play some tricks. So that's basically inherited for, from LTE. But the point here is that the slot length in, in millisecond shrinks when you increase the, the uh, subcarry spacing. And another difference here is the, the TDD baseline. Uh, you can dynamically, as part of the scheduling decision, you can pretty much on an OFDM symbol level determine whether this is uplink or downlink. Whereas in 4D, this was something that was semi statically configured. Here you have a, a lot more dynamic control of that. And then another thing that is um, in some sense unique to NR compared to, to previous generations. This <coughs> term slot, um, we have it here, but uh, <coughs> I, I wouldn't say it, it's a very important uh, 
term because you can actually start your <coughs> sorry actually start your data transmissions at any point inside the slot. So you can start at an arbitrary OFDM symbol. And that's of course a good thing. Uh, I mean, if data arrives here, why should you wait to until the slot boundary before you start your transmission? Why not start the, the data transmission as soon as possible? Or if you want to do beam sweeping with, with your beams, let's say you wanted to, to probe the channel with two, two of them symbols in each direction or transmit a small payload or something. Why should I wait until the next slot before I change the beam direction? Why not change them as soon as I can? can, I can? Or if you do uh, unlicensed spectrum, if the, the channel becomes available, uh, why should I wait until the slot starts and, uh, and re run the risk that someone else grabs the channel instead of starting transmitting my, my data immediately? So in, in the GPP discussions, this, this was known as uh, mini slot. Uh, the term is not used in the spec, but it basically means that you can start your data transmission at any point in time, at any OFDM symbol, you don't have to wait until the slot boundary. Which actually is, is good, especially for this latency reason. Some people argue that, uh, yes, if I want to do low latency service, I should have a high subcare space because then I get short slot duration and, and, and then low latency. But I think that is a flawed way of reasoning because Yes, you have a shorter slot duration, but you also have a shorter cycle prefix, which means that you, you cannot handle time dispersion as well. So what you typically do is that depending on your deployment, you select the subcare spacing. Is it a high frequency cell or is it a low carry frequency cell? Is it a large cell or a small cell? Things like that from your deployment, you controls which subcare spacing that you configure. Oh, and if, if you want to do low latency transmission, you use this mini slot thing. You, you, you start at whatever of them symbol that is suitable. So the, the, the slot length doesn't really play much of a role in MR, I would say, from a latency perspective. It's used in in some timing definitions and so on, but uh, it's not that that important. So in principle, better way of writing specification would probably be not to talk about slots at all and just talk about of them symbols. At least that's the mindset one should have when, when reading it. For the configuration, so it will be fixed uh, during the deployment, and that's it. I mean, static. Yeah, it, it's something that that you configure in a fairly static manner. You can, of course, reconfigure it in the in the cell, but that basically means restarting the cell. Um, and then, structure-wise, you actually configure it per bandwidth part. We haven't talked about bandwidth parts, and you can actually, in the specification, you can have multiple bandwidth parts configured in a UI. But uh, no UV supports that as of now. So it, 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 specification wise, you could in principle mix uh, multiple numerologies in the same cell, but it, it's not done in practice. And I think the, the incentive to do that is fairly small as well. Why would you why would you run with the two short cycle prefix compared to what, what the propagation conditions and and that cell tells you why would you pick a too large cycle prefix and see it's more more determined by by the deployment than anything else to this configuration i would say but but, but I, I, you will probably come back to the concept of control channels because this sets some uh, requirements on, on on control channels to be able to schedule separately each symbol right yes so we will we, we get back to that. I think it was the yeah after lunch sometime, the fourth part. <laughs> we, we, we will talk a little bit more about control channels. And yes, you, you're perfectly right. You you need to pinpoint which of them symbol the transmission starts at, and not just which slot. Uh, Stefan, uh, I have a question. Since you're in this slide with this uh, beam sweeping, uh, I would like to know what's the time scale to perform a beam search in the current uh, release of 5G or whatever. I mean, Ooh. I don't have a good number for from practice what you typically would experience. Um, I should probably <laughs> dig out sometime. Um, but it depends how many, I mean, first, you, you don't have to do a beam sweep. That's what you typically do if you have analog beam forming, which is, is kind of a common case at the high frequencies. Yeah. Um, and then at, at the millimeter range, you can have up to 64 beams. 
And in the initial access, you, you can pack in, is it two SSBs per slot? I think it is. So, well, what is an SSB, sorry? That, that, I mean, we get to that. That is basically the synchronization signals. Okay. And then, then you probably need a couple of milliseconds to, to go through all the, the beam directions you have uh, before it can start all over again from an oh. initial access self search aspect. Then yeah. once, you have, once you're up and running, then, then you can do more kind of beam tracking thing. Uh, I'm asking that because, uh, I mean, people uh, propose to use, uh, you know, pretty involved scheme to get rid of uh, beam search to some extent. And they would like to know how, how computing times compare to the actual procedure itself. Because if the procedure is uh, almost instantaneous, it's difficult to come up with an algorithm that can uh, reduce the beams, the, the, the search space. So that, 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 so that I'm asking that because I would like to have a grasp of the, 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 the timing of this. Of this okay. Thing. At least for initial access, I would say a couple of milliseconds for sitting through a decent number of beams in a cell, roughly okay. that range. Okay. But I'm sure, I mean, if, if you can come up with smart ways, I mean, the beam handling is a little bit of a, it is not a simple problem to solve. So there's certainly room to do, do smart things there. Yeah. But like I said, I mean, if, if the algorithm turns out to be super complex, then, then maybe it's not worth it. But uh, Perhaps one can find some some simple new novel scheme as well. Yeah, and especially if you move up to, to uh, even higher frequencies in more kind of a 60 context, uh, and more beam forming and, and so on. Then yeah, the I'm thinking about coordinated beam forming when you need to beam form uh, at both ends. Suppose that you have multiple antennas at both ends. In that case, I think it's not that uh, instantaneous, right? You need some feedback. Yeah, when it is. And that was actually a problem in at least in the first chipset out there that um, they when they lost the beam they basically restarted the whole procedure and it could take a 50 milliseconds or something like that or quite long time to to get back again which was more or less resulting in a dropped call uh, and that was some some particular implementations in some chipset that, that could lead to these type of things uh, that has been fixed in later chipsets okay so, but uh, I, I would say uh, that there is uh, quite a big uh, potential in, in the beamforming and the diploma. We, what we have seen is that the, the technology potential when doing beamforming and millimeter wave is that, yes, you can to some extent also do indoor coverage and coming through windows and things like that. Uh, of course, it depends a little bit what the window is made out of. Uh, but if you compare that with, with, the, with the absolutely first uh, generation of our base stations and, and uh, chipsets there were quite a big gap between <laughs> what, what the theory told you and what you could do in practice but that gap we have now seen shrinking because uh, products mature both on the on the network side and on the, on the chipset side uh, that people learn more and more how to build these algorithms how to do the beam forming beam search beam scanning etc so hopefully we, that will continue to shrink Mm -hmm. So there's a new new domain for for cellular industry to run in this millimeter way with beam for me. Okay. Thanks. Okay, some more uh, formalities or things that are good to know. We, we have something we call the resource grid, and that's basically the the sub carries in the frequency domain and the sub frame in the time domain, the millisecond. Then you get this, this all these squares, and then we have something called one resource block. And that's yeah, just another name for 12, 12 sub carriers during one of them symbol. That is a resource block. And then, of course, if I have a twice the sub carrier spacing, then I have another resource grid. Uh, and then the resource block is still 12 sub carriers, but then, of course, it's a little bit um, not as wide in, in frequency. And the resource element, that's absolutely the smallest unit you have. That's one sub carry and one of them symbol, one small little square here in the in this grid. Uh, sorry, is antenna part now here a conceptual thing or uh, or yeah, like teams? So no, an antenna port is, is something conceptual. So uh, if you have, let's say you have two transmit antennas at the base station because you want to do MIMO, then you have two resource grids, one per per antenna port. 
and also per subcare spacing if you run multiple subcare spacings. So I would say an antenna port, it's not necessarily a transmit antenna or something like that. It is rather a uh, an antenna and a reference signal for channel estimation as seen by the UE. If the, if the UE sees two different reference signals and, and can receive two, two data streams, that is two antenna ports. But then, of course, on the network side, you, you can implement that with whatever number of antennas you want, uh, at least two or more. So it is something which is like the base station or GNOB, whatever it is, is doing, whatever beam forming it does and using them to send certain reference signals. And that is creating those logical antenna ports to the UEs. Yeah, you, you you can do some beam forming to that UE, and within that beam, you may have two antenna ports if you if you do cross polarized MIMO, for example. So I, I typically view antenna port seen from the, the, the device side. What antenna elements and then so on can the the device see? And if you can, if you have two reference signals, then you can see two antenna ports and receive two two data streams. Then, of course, you can form another beam to another U at the same time and then transmit something to that U, and that U will see a few other antenna ports. Okay, thank you. And there is a hidden slide there with the, the definition of an antenna port copied directly from the specification. Uh, it's, I think it's a nice sentence, but uh, it's not a stringent mathematical definition as such, but. Uh, Two, two signals come from the same antenna port if you can can uh, derive the, the channel from one signal and use that for the other signals, roughly speaking. Okay, bandwidths. Uh, we can have a, a carrier, can be up to 400 megahertz wide in the specification, uh, compared to LTE where it could be 20. Uh, and another difference here that's quite important between NR and LTE is that in LTE, all UEs were supposed to be able to handle the carrier bandwidth, the full carrier bandwidth. So all UEs need to support 20 megahertz if you do 20 megahertz in that frequency band. Whereas in NR, the structure is such that you can, you can in principle, define a UE that is only capable of, let's say, 50 megahertz, but still run on the 400 megahertz carrier. And of course, if you just receive uh, parts of it. And we will see a little bit on the next slide what, what implication that could have. So that is one difference. It, it will probably be a little bit too costly to say that all you is through support 400 megahertz carriers. And then you can aggregate up to 16 of these carriers. So you can, in principle, do um, a total bandwidth of 16 times 400 megahertz. So that's, that's quite a lot. Uh, there's no practical UVs that, that does that. but uh, Specification allows you to do that, so you can do many gigahertz of bandwidth. So there should be plenty of room for, for future growth. And then we have something called bandwidth parts in NR. And I think, uh, I, I sometimes say that is one of the most over-engineered concepts we have. Uh, and it, it's something new in NR. I think it created quite a bit of mess and discussion when trying to figure out how to handle them. Uh, partially because different people have different understanding what to use them for and they became a little bit too flexible. But they they had a number of, of ideas. One of them was this bandwidth adaptation. Let's say you have a 400 megahertz carrier and a 400 megahertz UE, uh, and that consumes power to, to receive that full power bandwidth all the time. So maybe you could run your, your UV with just uh, 20 megahertz or something like that, uh, just to monitor control signal. And once you're scheduled, you blow up the full bandwidth and receive your, your, your data rate. And when that's done, you go back to the more narrow bandwidth. So that was one of the, the ideas behind this. Uh, and that led to this bandwidth part terminology. So we, in this example, we would have two bandwidth parts. Uh, number one and number two, and then one of them is active at a time. You configure both of them in UE, but at this point, the, the green number one is, is active, and here the blue number two is active. And that, that you can switch between the two controlled by, by the scheduling. So UE can actually be configured up to four bandwidth parts per carrier, uh, and one of these bandwidth parts is the active one. 
is the active band reporter duty scheduling within us one. And then it turned out that many parameters are configured per band report. Subcare spacing is one of them, uh, but also a lot of MIMO parameters and other things are, are configured per band report. So, uh, and typically you want to use the same MIMO scheme <laughs> regardless of which band report you activate. So then you have to configure the same in, in both of them and so on. So, but sorry. It, yeah. Uh, here, let's say that uh, up one, one bandwidth part, part is active. So does this hold for the base station or for the UI? That's the UI. This is the UI. Okay. I, I think one, one should read the, the, the whole specification as what the UI can assume and what the UI expects and so on. And then it, the, the base station does whatever it does. And if you have two UVs, then each of these UVs assume a certain thing. And then, of course, the base station needs to do, to do things so that they, they handle both of these UVs. So all of it is typically seen from the UV. Okay, thank you. The specification is written in the uplink, the UV shall transmit like this and that. And in the downlink, it's written like the UV can expect that, um, the type of terminology. Thank you. And then we have the, the coexistence thing. And I think this is one quite important thing that NR and LT can coexist on the same carrier. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is, of course, that you, you have some lower band spectrum. You, you have some spectrum in the two, three, four gigahertz range or whatever. You run LT there today. But as an operator, you, you would like to introduce 5G. One way of doing that is, of course, to shut down one LTE carrier and, and, and start NR there. But then you have the problem that there's not that many subscribers having an NR device, but you have a lot of people having LTE devices. And maybe your LTE network is already heavily loaded. So you can't afford that. But instead, you can actually do uh, some kind of overlay type of thing. You can put an NR carrier on top of the LTE carrier. And here comes to the choice of the subcarrier spacing comes back again. Since both NR and LTE can run with 15 kilohertz, it is quite easy to get this resource grid to, to match. And then you can schedule your, your NR data around the LTE data. And you, you can coordinate the two schedulers so that the NR and LTE schedulers, at least if they sit in the same base station, are tightly integrated and you can schedule these users. Now, this is also very important for, for the massive MTC technologies because in later parts of 4G, we, we introduced the narrowband IoT technology and the LTM or EMTC technology, which is both are more derivatives of LTE targeting massive machine type communication, very simple devices that don't send much data, but they will sit in the network for quite some time and have a 10 year battery lifetime and things like that. Uh, and just because you wanted to run NR, you don't want to go out and replace all these devices that you, you installed last year and someone told you that will sit there for 10 years. So that's another reason to do this coexistent thing that uh, maybe you move all your MDB users to, to NR, but you still have some massive MTC devices out there doing uh, narrowband IT or, or LTM. And they still need to coexist. So that's another usage of these coexistence mechanisms. And you can, of course, do both in uplink and downlink or just in one direction as you want. And this you can do on a very dynamic basis. You can, from scheduling decision to scheduling decision, you can decide which part of the frequency band you use for N or which part you use for, for LT. And now, uh, one of the last slides. Uh, before the break, a little bit on duplexing. We have a unified design for FTD and TDD. And as I said before, the a lot of discussions were, were starting in the TDD domain, which I think was, was kind of nice, actually. And having one unified design as much as possible, of course, you have to do some difference on, on the radio side in the end, if you build a TDD or an FTD radio. But as much as possible in common is good for um, mass market production. You, you get volumes. You don't have to develop multiple solutions. You develop one solution and then you get up the volume of that. And that, of course, means the price goes down and so on. 
So we can do TDD, upping and downing from the same frequency, take turns in time, or you can do FTD, where upping and downing are on different frequencies, and you, but all, all the time. You can also do half duplex FTD. And this is actually what is done in, in GSM, uh, for example. And it's also quite nice uh, because this is a way to, even if you have FTD spectrum, you, you can do without the duplex filter if you want to build a low end UV or low cost thing. So some MTC devices or something like that. So because you have separated up and down in time, you, you don't need a duplex filter to, which you otherwise would need here from stopping your, your um, downlink transmission to leaking into your uplink receiver and vice versa. And I would say that specification wise, I, I think you can actually also do some form of full duplex TDD if you transmit and receive at the same time on the same frequency. Uh, that of course has co quite a lot of impact on the, the implementation. How do you do this interference cancellation with your your strong downlink leaking directly into your uplink receiver. So this is not used in, in practice, but it's, it's something that is a little bit on the research table and, and uh, it's quite an active area on, on more research side, but uh, the, the MR structure would, would be able to do that as well. But in practice it's FTD and TDD that are the, the two, two used ones and to some extent have to fix. But on the, on the TDD side, uh, TDD is kind of interesting because uh, let, let's say I have a two, two cells set up and the, the rightmost cell transmits in, in the downlink to this device. Of course, that signal will, will go directly into the uplink receiver of the neighboring base station as well, trying to receive this UE at the cell edge. And that UE's transmission would, of course, disturb reception in this UE. So you have a lot of uh, interference, downlink to uplink and uplink to downlink interference in, in the or can have. And the classical way of solving that is to have a, a kind of fixed uplink downlink allocation that is the same in all cells. So you, you agree beforehand when, when you set up your system that I do a number of downlink slots, then I switch, and I do a number of uplink slots, and you have synchronized this across all the cells. So all cells do downlink at the same time, and all cells do uplink at the same time. Then, then you get rid of this problem. Uh, that, of course, has a drawback. If you think about a small cell deployment, you're alone in that cell. Maybe it's an isolated cell. You want to download a very big file. Why should you waste resources on uplink time slots? Or if you want to upload something, some very big object, why do I need downlink time slots at all? Then that type of scenario, wouldn't it be nice to have this on a very dynamic level that depending on what, what you want to happen in the cell at this point in time, the scheduler decides uplink or downlink, some form of dynamic TDD. And that is the, the baseline design in MNOR, that it is a dynamic TDD system. The scheduler controls when to do uplink and when to do downlink. And in principle, you can run completely independent between two cells if propagation conditions are such that you don't have too much interference between the two. And if you run in a more uh, traditional macro network with less of in, uh, isolation between the two cells, yeah, then you typically fall back on more kind of semi-static operation. You can basically agree beforehand in, in the two, two cells when to run up and when to run down link. And the reason why we started with dynamic TDD is it's much easier to, to restrict the dynamic system to something more static than the other way around. If you start with a static system, as we did in 4G, it's very difficult to try to add some dynamics to that system. 